So this, the reason I wanted to bring this up is, remember, you're just beginning your journey in the church. You're just starting. And, and one of the things that's a real danger, here's for you, is a real danger is to kind of just let things go. You've been disciplined. You've been coming to every Thursday night and involved in all these things and just kind of relax and just let things. And the, the problem is not so much probably that you just drop everything. You will drift away in terms of where you put your time, talent, and treasure. You're going to hear that a lot. Time, talent, and treasure. And Jerry was saying people are, some people are getting tired of hearing that. But it's, it's a good idea in terms of, and I want to talk about that in more spiritual um, way, in terms of time, talent, and treasure. Because remember, everything we have as Christians belongs to who? To God. Our very selves. Our souls belongs to God. So, our time, talent, and treasure all belongs to God. And I know before I talked about tithing, I'm not big on this percentage thing because I think every person needs to pray in terms of everything I have belongs to God. Now, what does he want me to do with it in terms of my time, talent, and treasure? Some people, he may say, you need to give 50% of what you make. He might say that to somebody. Somebody, he may say, 2%. Um, and, and the good thing is we should never worry about what God's telling somebody else. <laughs> we just need to worry about what is God telling me to do and encourage people to think about it and pray about it. So we look at the, the diagram, and, and this is not meant to cover everything, but it covers the biggest, the broader categories for the most part in terms of putting God at the center of everything we do. Um, and so if we just think and, and team and anybody wants to share and their thoughts because there's no way we can cover all this. Um, what's the first commandment? Love God. It's your whole heart, mind, and soul, right? Well, that's what Christ gave us. Well, what does that mean? You know, and, and part of that is what Paul says is we need to put on the mind of Christ. Think like Christ. Do behave like Christ. So how are we going to do that? So a key part of that is what? Prayer. Right? Prayer. And as I've said before, how you do it, I don't know how you're supposed to do it. I just know you're supposed to do it. Um, and it should become an integral part of your life in terms of not just having a set aside time, but as you go through the day, thinking about things and talking to God throughout the day. You know, you're, you know, you get mad at somebody in accident. Lord, bless them in abundance, you know. Turn it into a positive. You know, I mean, there's just a lot of things you can do and make your life a prayerful life. But you need to spend time with him. You need to spend individual time with Christ. And, you know, and, the, and we could talk about all the different kinds. We have a whole talk on prayer. <clears throat> but in terms of, you know, praising God and asking for things from God, you know, which we tend to do. Um, but, you know, and, and the reason that's okay is because God said to go ahead and do that. But he knows what you need. You know, Christ talked about it. Paul talked about it. He knows what you need. But you need to voice it because is what that's saying is, I have a need, and it's a demonstration for you of your faith. Who are you turning to to meet your need? So it's important for you to do that and voice it. We need to do that. Even though God already knows. So it's important to do that. Give praise to him for what he's done in terms of thinking, in terms of, again, and um, one of the things that the, the guy who gave the conference to this priest, he said that in several places he, he'd gone is that we're having terrible times in terms of attendance of people coming to their mass and to their church is, uh, and he, he learned how to, this formula that he did things, and what did he do? He said, the things that he focused on 
were good music and the liturgy, good liturgy, and good homiletics. And he said, in, at least for him, all the places he went, when he emphasized that, he didn't have to preach about and get, bringing in money. It just happened. Because what happens is people, when you have good liturgy, good homiletics, people become thankful and they want to share. And out of their, their gratitude, they want to share. And so that's what we have to focus on. It really, so in terms of time, talent, and treasure, is this is really an expression of our gratitude for what Christ has done for us. And we just put it in that little formula. Um, but the idea is here is, are you grateful for what God has done? And when we're grateful, then we're going to want to share. We are going to want to do more. And as I share this, remember, you always got to be careful is, and you look at this book, and there are lots of things to do. Believe me, I know. There are lots of things. And as Carlton shares, priest, there's lots of things to do. And you have to be careful because you can get too busy that you don't really have enough time to spend with God and getting re-energized. Now, I have to tell you, when I do teachings and whatnot, I typically get energized. But then my wife will say, you know, especially after homilies and whatnot, is then I'll crash, you know, because <laughs> I put a lot of energy into it, you know. So, um, but, but it does, you know, when you're serving the Lord, a lot of times it, you, the Spirit gives you energy. And so, and that, that's an important part of this. As you pray about this and get involved in things is, where's your energy? That's not a bad way to think about this is, do you get energized in doing that? Or is it, oh boy, I need to go do this. Now, that's not a bad thing either. I mean, obviously Christ didn't say, oh, yay, I want to get up there on that cross. <coughs> he just knew he had to do it. And out of love for us, he did it. Um, and sometimes we need to do that. Be willing to do that too. But it shouldn't be that way all the time. It shouldn't, all your ministry shouldn't be a cross. Because there's so many needs out there. God, God will typically give you the grace to do what he's calling you to do. So what, what is it that God's calling you to do? Um, and you can get so big because there's lots of good things to do. And as we talk about this in terms of this, each of these little circles here is, sometimes it may get lopsided where you're spending a lot of time in one service. And that may be okay at that time. Again, you've got to ask God. Be, and sometimes if you're stressed or whatever, you may need a spiritual advisor or something. Somebody Bring somebody else in to look at it objectively, help you discern through that. Um, which, by the way, Sunday I'm going to talk about spiritual discernment. Um, but usually it's not going to be that way all the time. You know, there may be seasons where you are focused on doing certain things on this circle. But some element should be, of, uh, you know, of each circle should be going on in your life. <clears throat> okay? So, you have the thanksgiving, adoration in terms of prayer, meditation, where you're thinking about scriptures, what God has done, the, you know, Christ's life, you know, and Paul, what he says in the Gospels, and contemplation, where you really, contemplation is more about letting really God speak to you and your heart. And the, the true contemplatives, <clears throat> it's usually a gift. The people are just where, they have these experiences that it's, you know, people can't really describe. And why God does that with some people and others, only God knows. <clears throat> um, but there's a way in which all of us can just sit there, be quiet, and let God speak to us. And at Mass. You know, I, I mean, I went to Mass for 20-something years, and, and I, to be honest, almost nothing would happen for me. And then all of a sudden, one day, actually, is what I, I, I shared the story. You know what? I'd be praying for my kids to have an experience with the Eucharist, and then one day I'm going up for the Eucharist, and bam! Man, it's like, whoa, where am I? You know? So, you know, you just never know when God's going to do that. And it's an experience that's great, but um, 
when and that may happen and Mother Teresa had it happen and then it went away for, you know, we said 50 years. So I, I don't, you know, how much I've said about that in this class, but so she you, had, huh? She had, conviction as well. she, was, she had great faith. She had great faith that she was even though, by God, which it, that strengthened that faith and that it, faith held yeah. through her whole life. Yeah. And, but you know, you read what she says and it makes you think in some of her critics and people who've read her, her writings would say, well, oh, she didn't really have faith. Well, the evidence is that she did is she continued to do what she did. She continued to turn to God. She continued to... To love. Exactly. That she is really, in spite of not getting any real feedback. Somebody who's in that situation shows that ultimately Christianity is, a, is not about what you get out of it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, and that's, that's where most people just fail to understand. Um, but, but, but you know, the thing is, is we all know that if we are faithful to the Lord, we do get a great deal out of it. But while you're here on earth, you may get nothing but spears and arrows and whatever, you know. So, you know, and uh, certainly in her case, she got a lot. But I am sure there's not much doubt in my mind where she's at. She's getting lots of consolation right now. <laughs> I should rephrase this. It's about willpower and not emotional gratification. Yes, yes, yes. Discipline and, and yeah. It's, it's a joy in the doing the will and the joy in loving and see the love in the people's eyes, you know, that kept her going. Right. It was her true love for them and their, she could see their love as well. Yeah. And oh, that's yeah. What carried her on. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you read what she says. She'll talk about how horrible things are for her personally. And then she'll go talk to one of her sisters and just say the most loving thing. <laughs> it's just remarkable. I would encourage you to read her book. Um, individual prayer, liturgy of the hours, you know, especially, you know, when you get into those times, if you're really having a hard time praying, you know, like some people will say, what a great, wonderful, you know, personal prayer time. They're, they're talking to the Lord and, you know, and it's going great and everything. Well, I can just about guarantee you there will be a point when that will not be the case. And what do you do? Well, that's where the rote prayers and the things that the church provides for you can be a great source of strength, as you can turn to when you're not having this real personal thing, is you can turn to the liturgy of the hours and think of yourself as, you know, I'm, I'm participating with millions of people and voices. I'm part of that to give yourself strength, you know. And the litany, yeah, you can say the litanies. You can pray the scripture. Um, you know that when you read the scripture, is is there's a way in which you can think about it as a prayer. Um, and then the rosary, and on and on and on. So I mean, you need to have your individual time, but at the same time we're communal, so we need communal prayer too. And obviously the the little church is where most of that communal prayer goes for a lot of people. For you all, anybody who's got young kids and a family, um, that's where most of it should be, couples. Okay. And then the bigger church. Um, so you need to look at that. And obviously the pinnacle of communal prayer is the Mass. And so we need to be participating in that regularly. And that's prayer and a sacrament. And so these circles clearly overlap. Even though they're not drawn that way, they do overlap. Um, when we go to Mass, Mass should be prayerful. Um, you know, when you've got young kids, it's hard. I know for a long time, I spent a lot of time in the back of the church <laughs> holding kids that were fussing and whatnot. Um, you know, you just do the best you can. You know, I mean, there are seasons where it's hard to do much. You know, and in terms of being involved in church in these as aspects, is one of the things is that these aspects should clearly be going on in your home. In terms of the bigger church, in terms of time, talent, and treasure serving there, 
you know, when you've got a lot of young kids or whatnot, you just don't have much time to do that. But it may be good for you to try to find time and make time for that so you're interacting with more adults, you know, besides your spouse, to be stretched and grow. Um, but again, that's where, you know, we can't tell you what to do. But you sure need to be seeking what does God want you to do? What does the Holy Spirit want you to do? Other than we can say you need to pray. You need to go to church. You need to go to Mass. And so in, in terms of if you're loving God, what did Christ always say? What does it mean to love God? Obviously spending time with Him. That's what prayer is all about, right? Going to Mass. But how else do you love God? Okay, but one, one step before that. Huh? <laughs> well, let's get... What did he say? What did Christ say? If you love me, what will you do? You will obey him. You will obey me. You will do what I want you to do. You'll follow my example. That's the most basic, is that God is a God about doing. And that's why we, when we talked about this whole idea of dualism, spiritual over here and physical over here, no. Christ, you can't, that's why we talk about faith and works. Because if you have faith, you will do works. You can't separate them. It's all part of who we are. And so, he said, if you love him, you'll do what he said. Follow his example. So, in, in, what we need to do then is, well, how do we know what to do? Now, we have the precepts of the church, and we have the command, Ten Commandments in terms of what we shouldn't do. But what is it that God is calling you to do? Um, well, you've got to study, right? You've got to be praying so that the Holy Spirit can guide you and God can be part of your life. But then you've got to study, do an examination of conscience in the evenings before you go to bed in terms of, okay, how did I do today, Lord? Um, it's a good way to, to end the day in terms of, okay, who did I mistreat and offend or, you know, how did I sin today and, uh, you know, what do you, what do you want me to do about that, Lord, you know? Because, you, you know, sometimes people will want to rush to go and, oh, I need to go ask forgiveness. Well, you got to be careful about that because you may have offended somebody and they may not even know it. And then it's like, well, you go to them and you feel better and now they're like, wow, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they walk away wounded. So be, just be careful about that. Um, you know, go on retreats. Study the saints. There's a great website. It's called um, www.saintoftheday.org. And it pulls up a little blurb. So every day, you can pull up a saint and look at their life. And look at as somebody to model. You know, you can buy books that goes in a little more depth about the saints. And some of their stories are just remarkable. Just remark can be so inspiring. Some of them we know very little about because they're so ancient. You know, in the first couple hundred years, um, typically in the first couple hundred years they were martyred <laughs> in the church, you know, uh, or tortured or something, you know, like that. They were physically abused. Uh, okay, so, huh? First twenty-two folks. Yep, yep. So. Love God, that's a first, and so the second commandment, as we said, is love our neighbor. So how do, we, how do we love our neighbor? And that's part of, again, this circle is, but as I keep saying, is we've got to have the Holy Spirit to guide us in terms of how God wants us to do that. Because there are so many needs. If you just sit down and think about just through the day and what's going on out there, I mean, there just can be overwhelming. It can be paralyzing to think of all that really needs to be done. All I got to figure out is what God wants me to do. You know, part of this is going about and what I like to say is planting seeds. Just plant little seeds throughout the day. I, I just share a story is um, years ago when I this was sh shortly after I became a Christian. Um, this was at uh, MCG and one of the fellow faculty. Now. I, not all Presbyterians are like this, but this guy was a hard-nosed, cold, which sometimes Presbyterians have been known for, rigid, <coughs> legalistic, <coughs> Presbyterian. 
And but I but I knew some others that were just totally the opposite in that church. But this was, and so this guy that I was working with one day, he was a psychologist, and and he says, "Wow, if that's what a Christian's like, I don't want to have anything to do with it." And I looked at him and I said, "Well, he's not my model. Christ is my model. Do you have a problem with Christ?" You know. And of course that shut him up. <laughs> and and he actually became a Christian. And he never said anything about whatever influence I had, you know, and I just, you know, didn't think much about it, you know. I mean, I'm a human being. I, I, I'd like a little positive feedback here, you know. But anyway, so I just never thought much about it. It's 20 years later, just a cup, about two months ago, over 25 years, and he sent back this note. He said, well, how, how are you all doing, you know? Da, 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 and he started talking about the impact that I had in his life. Little seeds. And you never know. You may never get to see them coming to fruition. Somebody else gets to that privilege, you know. But is all you got to do is think about going around planting little seeds. And, and uh, you don't have to do big things. You know, remember what Scripture says, be faithful in small things. Now remember, though, being faithful in those small things, and guess what? You might get a big one to do. <laughs> a big task. So, but God will give you the grace to do that. Uh, so we got, and why do we love our neighbor? Because, you know, somebody, I was talking to somebody about this in terms of, of loving themselves, in terms of um, their attitude and self-image and whatnot. And, well, you, you have to love yourself. Why? Because you're in the image and likeness of God. That's why that commandment's there in terms of loving yourself. Because you're in the image and likeness of God. So you have to love yourself. But who do you love first? It's got to be Christ. You only love yourself because you're in his image. And by doing that, that helps you to have the strength and grace to then go on and love your neighbor. And, and that's the only reason you should love yourself, is to give you the strength and the confidence, because you know God loves you, cares for you, that then you can go and love others. Not to love yourself too go around and, you know, hey, aren't, aren't I special and whatnot, and let your ego get in there. So, because you are in the image and likeness of God, we have to, and all your neighbors are, then we have to love them no matter how bad they are. Even Hitler was in the image and likeness of God. Maybe a rather smudged, poor image, but still. Um, and he died to save them, right? Your neighbors. But we need the Holy Spirit in order to guide us in dealing with all that. We need the sacraments. And that's part of the reason why we need the sacraments. To get the grace to love our neighbors, right? It helps us also to love God. But most importantly, it's God really loving us in the sacraments so that we can go love others. And of course, you know, for us as adults, once you're confirmed, the big... The, Repetitive sacraments or the Eucharist and, you know, reconciliation and confession. So we need to participate in those regularly. And what I would tell you to do, you should do it today when you go home, is set a goal. I would suggest to you, I mean, the church says once a year if you committed a moral sin, but you really think in terms of monthly. Because that way if you skip a month, then you can make it up or whatever. But think in terms of going to confession monthly. I think John Paul did it almost daily. <laughs> you know, Mother Teresa did it almost daily. I mean, whenever she could, just about, you know. Confess your sins daily. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Every, every, that's the examination of conscience in the evening. It's in terms of confessing it daily. But in terms of going to confession getting that grace so that you can love your neighbor and love yourself. Because, you know, we all have a lot of psychological baggage that, in terms of the way we were raised and whatnot. I was talking to somebody today, counseling somebody, and it's just all this stuff that people, baggage that people bring with them. Um, yeah, amen. Yeah. Good. Say that louder. <laughs> I just, I mean, it was like something you didn't know was there. 
Sure. That was gone. I mean. You feel, yeah, I mean, experience of like this weight gone. Yeah. This load, you know, you this baggage that you've been carrying around, you know, yeah. <laughs> gone. Exactly. Right. And and you and be patient with the yeah. fact that you know you may not you went you know and this first time and but uh, it's not necessarily that you got rid of it all. And, and what I say is in terms of you may have been forgiven and whatnot, but there may be things there that you are just not even aware of that you really need to confess. Um, that that takes time. For you even to be able to see it or accept it. And so that may take time so that that's what. Given all you knew, you know, all you. Oh, yeah, you, you were given the grace and. Yeah, exactly. But, but, is, but there can still be hurts and things there that you, that you need to confess in order to. It's like you got rid of a lot of baggage, but there may be some other baggage still there. That may take time. To, to, you know, and so you may be partially healed of wounds and stuff, too. A lot of times uh, that part of that baggage is unforgiveness of others for things that have happened to you. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if, if, you ever, if you ever get that sense, I've arrived, or feel like I've arrived as a Christian, you're in trouble. <laughs> if you ever run away from that. Those are because, graces, too, that you've received, that you can overcome the rest. And God takes right, you where you're at. Right, exactly. Yeah. Because, yeah, like I said, there, there could be things there that are, that are hidden or deep that you just really couldn't handle. Um, but that need to be dealt with. So, hey, it's, it's, as Ellen says, it's a lifelong process. Um, so, you need to participate in that regularly. Um, and that's also part of the prayer. And praying for others in terms of interceding. That's part of our loving our neighbor. Is praying for them and praying blessings upon them, you know. The people that you dislike or, or maybe even hate, which is really, you know, a strong word, but I mean, there, you know, there could be people where you have such strong feelings about because of past wounds. Pray for them. Pray God's blessing upon them. You can never go wrong in praying God's blessings upon somebody, no matter how bad they are. Because guess what? He's going to deal with them. Have we got time to hear a few of their experiences? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I just, uh, just a couple more comments because I didn't have a whole Love others. Remember just in terms of who specifically that we always need to think about in terms of when we're praying about time, talent, and treasure, in terms of helping is who is our fundamental option to, to, to work for. The poor, the widow, the orphan, the imprisoned, the ill, the downtrodden. Those are the kinds of folks that should always be in the forefront of our minds. Um, and that's not easy, you know, as we've talked about in Rich Christians, this book that I mentioned in terms of rich Christians in a hungry world. The answers are not s simplistic. But be careful about, you know, when you're looking at time, talent, and treasure and giving money, be careful of the organization. Make some effort to pick an organization that's good. You know, I would not give it to United Way. I mean, that's my opinion, my bias. I would never give to United Way. I would pick where the money goes. It's not a bad organization, but sometimes the money does go to things that I think are questionable. In some areas, it could go to Planned Parenthood. So be careful. Um, uh, and w they'll say to you, well, you can specify what it's going to. Well, guess what? If, if you're part of the United Way and you specify this organization, well, that just means that'll free up money to go there. So you should pick where you, God wants you to put your money. And that's not easy. You know, but, but there are certain groups, especially Catholic charities and some groups, that you, you look in terms of that 90 plus percent of the dollars go to the people they're supposed to be helping. You know, some of these organizations, 
10% um, of the money that you donate actually goes to whatever's the intended recipient. A suit, what I would call a pseudo charity. Um, nice front organization. Um, you know, and remember your family. I mean, you know, as we said, the little church should be one, one of the, and it's easy to neglect your family in terms of all this, to get caught up. I, you know, when I do teach engaged couples, I teach men, your work really starts when you walk in the door of that house. Because you've been working probably all day, and you may be tired, but if there's young kids that you need to help, you need to be involved. And so that takes more work. Because you're tired and worn out from the day. And not just sit and flop in front of the, the easy chair and drink a couple beers and watch TV all night. Get involved. You need to be involved. Um, this is a bit more exciting. evil. <laughs> we... <laughs> yeah. Evil. Evil. Okay. Service. Serve. We need part of this is, you know, even though we've been talking about service is, and that's part of the, the poor whatever is, pick something that's not necessarily easy to. I mean, there should be a part of this that is difficult to some degree. That doesn't mean every week or whatever, but part of your life in terms of service should be something that's difficult for you. Um, in terms of helping you to grow. But a lot of times it, those are, you know, the, the most difficult people, you know, dealing with homeless can be really, really difficult. Sometimes it's easy, depending on your personality and whatnot. Um, so stretch yourself in terms of thinking, is this really service? Because if it's too easy, then is it really service? It shouldn't be that easy. Yeah, you should have the grace, but... Um, and there's a way in which you can have the grace and be at peace, and it still be difficult. And those are all parts of growing in, in your maturity in the life. Let me just finish, because one more. Fellowship. You know, you, you need, in terms of spending time with others, who do you spend your time with? Obviously, you have family, but if you're single or you've got, you know, a young couple, who are you spending your time with? It says a lot about you, doesn't it? Now, you could be spending your time with somebody that you're trying to evangelize, and that's okay, but remember, you know, just like... The church throughout history, you find the church has tried to evangelize cultures. But in that process, sometimes the church got corrupted by the culture. And when you're hanging around with people who are not following the Lord's will or trying to do God's work, you can be corrupted by them. So you have to look at that. You should make a serious examination in terms of who are you fellowshipping with and you need to help, you need to make sure if you're if fellowshipping with some people that you're trying to evangelize, you need to fellowship with others that are helping you to be stronger Catholics. So you need to find people like that. And within this church, somebody's talking about our parish being too big. Well, I promise you, if you make the effort, you'll find people that you can relate to and uh, will help you. I mean, there's enough variety in our parish that if you make that effort, you'll find somebody that'll help you grow and you can relate to. And look for opportunities. Prayer groups, you know, during the Lenten prayer groups, that's a great way to fellowship. But you want something, you should have something in place all year round. You know, some people go off and they have 
a little breakfast together and and now the better ones sometimes they just go off and gossip about it but <laughs> But hopefully the, the better ones, they go off to talk about things, you know, after church or whatever. So what, what are you doing? What is the fellowship doing? And, you know, as Alan likes to say, and what we learned in my diaconate, is it life-giving or death-dealing? And so uh, look for that in terms of fellowship. So Jerry wanted to say Easter Vigil and not the candidates because it's so long. Of course, if you really think about it, though, it's so long because of all the readings and, you know, and everything else. And, and it probably wouldn't cut down on the amount of time that much. It would make it a little shorter. And I, and I remember sitting there, you know, at the chair uh, during Mass and looking out and thinking, wow, there aren't very many people here. It's a good thing we got a lot of candidates. Because <laughs> they got their family and friends there, and, you know, and their sponsors and, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, Warren Robbins, uh, they did each person individually rather than trying to do it all with a group. Uh -huh. three hours and something. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Send him over. <laughs> <laughs> My 10-year-old grandson who was there asked me on the way home if Mass was always that long in <laughs> the church. <laughs> yes, it's long for kids. It definitely is. So anybody want to share about their experience? And or, by, or by confession. Yeah. The retreat. Anybody, you know? I thought the retreat was wonderful. I really did. I got so that's, much out of that. That's probably I, the best part of it. I mean, not that the whole thing wasn't good, but that weekend was just, it was just awesome. awesome. Yeah. And you know what that is? What is that? You think it's Jerry? You think it's me? You think it's the priest? You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit at work. Yeah, yeah. I, you can just feel it. I always say there was a joy to watch all y'all. Because we saw you like from the September to now to watch all y'all go up there, especially the ones that were, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the were baptized. They haven't seen it. I just, I was so blessed by that. I, get a, I was just in the joy of the Lord. It's like all family the first day, too. We've never been, I've been this involved, and it's like family here. It's been a, for us being new in the parish, it's been like a family experience. So you think kind of just like mm -hmm. our little support group, we were going to do it up here at Shrine Group, but we didn't because we had this, and then something every night, we really could sit it in. We thought, this is kind of like our support group. So thank you all for, it is a part of your system. All you guys and the old fellas. Thank you. 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 I'm looking at catechumen, but I like it that the choir sang a little thing for each catechumen as they got baptized. And that's one thing that's been really nice about this. Like, I, I believe it was both you and Ellen who put those baskets together. Okay. <laughs> I'm mad enough to admit it. Well, that's what I did a nice job, but I mean, I just, I just appreciate all the effort that went into that and the thought that went into it. And, and yes, uh, but I will. But I will get credit. That that's Kathy Hayden. Okay. That was her idea. Yeah, Laura helped. But this was Kathy Hayden's idea. She had this list and stuff, and so all I did had to do is get it together. So. Yeah. I guess you know. Part of me assumes that everybody does these sort of things. You know. <laughs> Oh dear. My, my daughter, who was here, she would say, she said about the basket, she said, gosh, we didn't have that. And I forgot what else she would say. No, we didn't have that. Y'all had a retreat. Yeah, it was just a sort of. Wow, now, see, I think retreat, I, most places I thought did retreats, at least something.
maybe reawaken them to get a little bit more. their interest a little? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, even though they're already Catholic, they may just become more sedentary and then just come back to the United Yeah. But you know, and that's our human nature, as I was saying earlier, is, is most people, uh, I mean, some people are going to have a, an issue come up and they may just turn away from the church. But most people just drift. You know, you all know what entropy is? How many people here know what entropy is? Yes, you college educated people. <laughs> you know, basically it's a, uh, principle of physics is that um, the universe tends to disorder, to be less complex. Um, we heard that Father Karaki talk about that the other Yeah. Well, I, I've said this for a long time is, well, God is the God of order, our God. So what is the devil? The God of disorder. entropy, disorder. Um, so, and in, in the reason that's an important principle that it affects us in terms of human behavior is it takes discipline and work to keep us in order, to keep us in our relationship with God, with each other, you know, especially in our uh, fallen natures. It takes effort and energy. That's why entropy in terms of it's a lower energy state and to, to achieve a higher energy state, you've got to put energy in. And so it's just something we always have to fight against in terms of, and that's, that, and that's why I'm trying to emphasize this, and next week we'll talk about time, talent, and treasure, is don't let this slip away. People tend to come after Easter, they've got these good feelings and a good experience, and then they let it drift. Please, don't. That's why this is so important, this is the order, you know, order, and that, that thing you're saying about um, your friendships, your fellowship, who you hang with, because... As your friends are, so you'll be like them. Um, my, my good friend here was just detailing me because I had mascara down my face. And so I have certain friends are like, in my life, you know what I'm saying? That is a detailed guy, and my friend Anne was telling her, and that's kind of a gift to me because in my spiritual life as well, I get to have Anne and Patrick just saying, hey, there's a little mascara in your soul. You said, okay. So then they will tell me, you know, in this area, you're off balance, either off balance and you know, your life are off balance in a sin area. And I come to grace because, like, y'all were talking about the, um, the confession and feeling God's presence. The greatest presence you can feel is like the conviction of the Holy Spirit and not the, the feeling. is cool. You know that when someone's doing sin and you hear the Holy Spirit saying it, then you change. That's the greater gift. It's a, it's Amen. In your life, surround yourself with those people that detail you in your soul so that you can always walk up to you because the of the heart. I have to have those people. I'm sorry, I do. I'm not. I like what right now I have to have this, but I'm like this. I'm a, I'm a mission for God. And, hey, wait a minute. You know what I'm saying? See? So I appreciate it. Those of you who, who, who feel free to correct me always, because I will take that and write to Deacon Mong and say, this person said that, and they're wrong. <laughs> and you need those people to say, no. No, you need those people to be free in your life to say, get your friends and say, hey, correct me, please. Don't you think? If you don't have those, if you're not open to that, then. And I pray for you because there's something God is saying over and over again. And you're going like, that's not God. Yeah. Because you don't want to hear the conviction. It's your sin in your life. You don't want to change. Yeah, you know, when Ellen says that in terms of they're wrong, is that when you say that, are you saying that because that's what you think? Or because that's what the church thinks? Uh, you know, people will give me, you know, sometimes say something about, you know, yeah. uh, well, how can you say you're right or whatever? And say, it's not about me. It's about what the church says. Doesn't matter whether I'm right. Matters whether the church is right. <laughs> what does the church say about that? You know, and some things are, it's not so black and white. And some things there's a spectrum of what's right or wrong. But some things it's just really crystal clear what the church says. <laughs> I have two questions. One, one is for Dan. <clears throat> I saw him up on the altar, and it was like his countenance changed. He has not been the same since. <laughs> In spite of your provisional baptism, you know, I had to sit there and make sure Father McDonald, Father, oh, that's provisional. You know, so, so Father says, you know, in a very low voice, and then he says out loud, I baptize you in the name of, if you have not been baptized. <laughs> I, I was wondering what your first insight was. How are you talking about the whole thing? I'm curious of what 
exact timing you thought I, I had that change. When you came out of the pew and went up, mm -hmm. it was just like, just like that. You concentrated, and then when the ceremony was over and you just stand up there, it was like it just came out of the I, I gotta admit, like the, the entire journey just came to fruition like that that night. Like the first time that Bridget, my fiance, and I entered this church to check it out when we first got here uh, late last year, um, I knew when I came out of this church that this is where we were going to get married, that this is where we were going to make our new Christian lives. And that's when I started getting in touch with Father Justin and Deacon Mongan and getting involved in uh, the RCA process. And um, that night, having not only her there, my future in-laws came in from Philadelphia uh -huh. uh, to come down for that, and they were my sponsors into the church. And just, it was a whole new beginning to everything that I had lying in front of me. And a whole new revitalization of my Christian faith that, you know, was not exactly dying by any means, but uh, just found a new home and uh, a new strength. So uh, it was one of the most magnificent nights of my entire life. So when I spoke to you afterwards, you spoke with such conviction and with such conviction and such uh, sincerity. I have a thousand questions for everybody, but one question for everybody. Uh, has anyone made a special uh, intent for themselves as to something specific that they will do in order to maintain the, the fire? You know, chose, chosen something within the church to... With, within you, whatever you might be, something very specific, like if you're going to pray at a particular time or if you're going to go to Mass uh, extra time during the week, or, or is there something special that you yourself show, or, or a couple of things, or just one thing? And I know that I want to work with the Family Advancement Ministry. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to do great Yeah. And, and you, you know, when you, when you, in those kinds of things, is you'd be surprised in terms of how, you know, many people will share stories in terms of how they did some kind of service or something, you know, I'm going to serve them and come away and they're the ones who feel like they've been served, you know. <laughs> and that's that's how God works. That's how the Spirit works. But We don't want to put anybody on the spot. And, and you know, and that, that's important that you listen to that. And you know that because that's one of the ways the enemy will work. Or, uh, will work is to give you something that really looks good, but it's not what God wants for you, right. and it can just tear you down. It can it can look so good. It's almost like that forbidden fruit in terms of, and and yet you know objectively it may look good, 
But it's really, and so that's, that's that inner voice, the Holy Spirit, saying, you know, and, you know, and I've had that happen to me. I don't know if I ever shared the story. You know, I actually came to look for a job here in Macon. When I was looking for a job to move back, because I had my conversion experience, and God was saying, move back near family, because not all the family was Florida or Georgia. <coughs> um, so I considered Florida and, and interviewed there and, and Georgia, and, and I never really heard of it, MCG, to be honest with you, Medical College of Georgia, and, and I'd read about Mercer was just starting then. And uh, so I came out, and, um, and the other part of that story is my father-in-law, Ellen's dad, just walked it into MCG and said, well, you got any jobs for family doctor, faculty? You know? And the dean sent him over to the family medicine department, and they said, well, we just might have a job. And so um, he mentioned it to me, and I said, okay. So I came to Augusta, because I stayed with them in Augusta, and was going to drive here. And um, I thought, well, because I was going to come here on Monday, and I thought, well, I'm in Augusta, so I'll, or Aiken, I'll just go to Augusta. So I went to Augusta, MCG, Monday, Tuesday, and it's like I met all these Christians in the Department of Family Medicine. And then I came to Macon, to Mercer, and it was a horrible situation. Just, even though the potential, in terms of the new school starting up and the curriculum looked really interesting, but the job would have killed me. Um, and so I went back to MCG and they said, well, we're meeting Thursday night. So I went interviewed there Monday, Tuesday, came to Macon on Wednesday. On Thursday, they met a, the board of a community health center in Warrington, Georgia. And they made a decision to have this contract with MCG, which created the job for me. And they offered it to me on Friday. Now that's unheard of for faculty. For faculty positions, typically, you come, you interview, you go away, you bring your wife back, interview again, maybe come back for a third interview, you know. It was like, boom, boom, boom. It's like, whoa, I think God's hand's in this, you know. <laughs> um, and, and getting the, you know, the position here in terms of the way things happen, so. Um, have, we, have we got time to absolutely. do more? Absolutely. Okay. Anybody else care to, care to share? The, the, re the reason I'd ask this is because I, some of you have come to me and shared some things with me and I just thought they were absolutely awesome. And a lot of times in, in speaking them, they become who you are. Right. And they become more real to you. Yeah. It builds a faith. Confession. But it's like it put, I think what Jerry's saying, it, it almost like puts a seal on that in terms of in your spirit to have a confidence that God did that. God is doing that. It's that step out in faith and you speak from the mouth with the heart of God. Right. And Confess with your mouth. I can almost, I can almost see John coming out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and I, I know some people it's hard to share in a group, they don't mind sharing one-on-one, -on -one, but some people are uncomfortable sharing in a group. And that, but you know what, if you have some neat experiences, it would really be nice to go around and share them one-on-one -on -one with other people if you don't want to do it in a group, you know. And, and, you know, the other part of that is sharing for the leaders, the team leaders here, you know. <laughs> they like to get positive feedback. <laughs> And yes. Have you seen your pictures? Well, you need to get a CD. In the southern. You ended up being like the poster child for all of us because on <laughs> Father McDonald's blog, oh, he yeah. was receiving you into the church and you just look like you're in ecstasy. Oh, I mean, you're just so happy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't yeah. know what showed. Yeah. I got a video of that. I'm going to include it. Okay. I haven't seen it. Well, uh, Judith, would you, would you be willing to share a little bit about in terms of your husband? And, and you, in terms of uh, the, the, the last minute, what you were going to do no matter what? Well, I mean, I, you mean about Coming in. Treat? Well, my father got, my parents both were diagnosed with cancer right yes. before all of this. And my mom, well, actually, my mom was operated on, and, and she's okay. And then the next day, my sister calls me and says yeah. that our father's been um, found to have cancer also in two spots. And... and um, 
they're divorced and my sister was actually suspicious because she doesn't get along with him that he might just be sort of like having a sympathetic cancer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. That... I wanted to go so badly on Saturday. Oh, and also the day my mom had her surgery that Thursday before the Saturday retreat, Father McDonald called me and said that my husband and I could go into the church because the annulment went through that he had to go through. And so um, I was so excited. I was excited about Saturday because I didn't know I was going to be doing that. And then I really wanted to come in at Easter, even though I knew if I couldn't, it would happen later and it would still be very nice. But um, then I found out about my dad, and I felt like I just, he lives in South Florida, I felt like I just had to go down there, partly because of my, I didn't know if my sister was going to even be still speaking to him. So I went, and, um, but I was still kind of determined to come back for Easter. But I knew that I might not be able to. But it all worked out that I was able to come back. And my dad actually just started radiation therapy today. So um, my husband, Mark, decided while I was down there to come in because he's been on the fence. He didn't do RCIA, but he met with Father McDonald many times earlier, like when we were starting RCIA. And it's been kind of hard for him because he's a, now an ex-Lutheran minister. Yeah. And it was very hard. And he's still a little depressed because it's it's like he studied for years, he made a big commitment for years, and it's just like it's all gone up in smoke because things just never worked out. And it's part and, and he's flirted with the Catholic Church for like thirty years off and on. And um, he came here one of the first times he came to Macon years ago. He came to this church. He was just like drawn to it. But um, he goes to daily mass, and I go with him as much as I can. When it gets to be summer here, you can't do anything outside unless you do it really early. Before. Exactly. And that's kind of what I do. But um, he, that's what that's one reason he came into the church is because there is such a thing as daily mass, and it just means a huge amount to him. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so yeah, you know, certainly if he wants to talk to any of us, or you know. Or, or this might be a time he needs to talk to Father McDonald again, you know. <laughs> He's going to be all right. Yeah. yeah, because it's like he gained, but yeah, at the same time, it's a, it's a big change. Well, and his, his daughters aren't necessarily happy with him about it. Sure. And, you know, it, it's, that's a risk, and Father McDonald said that's a risk you take, because you can end up alienating everybody in your life. Oh, yeah. Some people, some people come into church and literally their families have ostracized them. Well, but, but I think the one thing I was going to say is what you said, but is to emphasize the fact that Judith had made her decision regardless of what her husband. Yeah, and he was okay with that, too. He was very happy for me. And I think what I told you that evening was that he was glad because it's always seemed like I tagged along with him. I became a Christian because I knew him. And because he taught me is that I did this on my own. Yeah. So he was very happy for me. Even if he had so that, there's somebody we can pray for. Pray for Judas' husband. And, and you know, uh, pray for uh, Louise and the others who didn't come in. Yeah. You know, that would be somebody to pray. You know, Louise Mesmer, you, I, I don't know if you remember, but she said in the beginning she wasn't going to become Catholic, you know. And then she, she obviously, she wants to, I think she pretty can, well convinced me that she would like to become Catholic. You know, but it's a whole marriage situation there, you know. Um, with her, with her husband. So, uh, pray for that. You know, God's. Is not an easy thing to go through. No. It's very hard for the person who is can relive their marriage. Yeah. They may be living a very bad marriage, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of guilt. Like you feel like you shouldn't be doing the annulment, but you know you ought to be. And... Oh yeah, that's why it's very. That's why I think we say, again, my opinion in terms of why we tend to say annulment because the church doesn't really annul, because the church can't undo a marriage, valid marriage. The church declare, gives a declaration of nullity to say it never was. Well, emotionally, as human beings, that's hard to say. You live with somebody for 20 years and say, oh, it never was. So I think that's part of why we call it annulment. You know? sister insisted that you can't get an annulment without paying somebody off. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to convince the church that it's okay to participate. Remember what? Remember what I said about sinful? There was a time <laughs> when uh, literally th there was, were times in the church when you could, quote, get one. But of course, you know, in the end, uh, um, does God really recognize that? But, but I think 
You know, I thought about that. I don't know what Carlton thinks about that, but theologically I would say is, you know, if the, the church declared, gave a declaration of nullity and there was something like that going on, the sin is not on the couple. The sin is on the, the person who did it. They're, they become the responsible party. What's the, what's the possibility that Mark could come join us in these next few classes? It's not his thing. <laughs> 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 I thought maybe we could draw him in. No, he's, he's Love him all along. He just did <laughs> one. Yeah. yeah. Because he's, he's such a friendly guy. And well, he's such a great guy. But, but, I mean, but Jerry, I mean, the way you are so friendly to him means a lot to him. All along. And people here at the church are so friendly. I know people see this as a really big church, but to me it doesn't seem like a big church because so many people are so friendly. I mean, Elaine Schmidt is just as nice as can be, and so are you. But, I mean, and a lot of people are. Yeah. Good. Good. But I think, you know, Dane, what you said, that was my experience. When I, when I walked into, I was looking around, and no way was I going to become Catholic. And I walked into Holy Trinity, it's like, whoa, something going on here, <laughs> you know. And, and, and there are churches that seem to have more of a charism. Obviously, God's in every Catholic church, but there just seems to be some where there's more of a charism where people just, I mean, Holy Trinity is one of those where I can't tell you how many people would come up and say, yeah, I just walked into church and I knew I was home. That's what happened to Charlie and I here. Psycho? We walked Yeah. Again, that's the Holy Spirit. We can't take credit for it. Several of my classmates from Christ the King called me the day after, on, on Easter afternoon, and uh, just to say, you know, congratulations and, and all of that. They were always very supportive. And uh, I was telling them about the retreat, and I, I said, uh, I was talking to this one real close friend of mine, and I said, you would not believe the retreat. I kept wishing you were there because we sang O Solitaris uh -huh. and t the Tantum Ergo. And she was saying, oh, I wish I had been there. I haven't heard any Latin in years and years. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've been saying uh, Dominus Vobiscum that it's like, no, wait, what's the English? <laughs> 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 it's like, nobody does that conspiracy too. Okay, well, this has been fun. So please, you know, we, we you know, we'll try to encourage people to uh, come next week because that'll be very informative. Um, and, and take the books and materials here with you and be prayerful. What does God want you to do? And you know, God may not want you to do anything on that, but. I know he wants you to do something. <laughs> He's got something there for you. We, all, we all already have one person who's volunteered to be a uh, usher. And, and probably one of those jobs is taken for granted, but really has a very important role. If you do it right, because you're greeting people. You're the first, one of the first faces that people see in terms of greeting people and knowing something about the church and sharing with people, especially visitors and everything, and being positive. And, and actually, I think ushers need to be willing to be a little bit more militant than some of ours are, because like, if you see somebody walking back with the uh, Eucharist and they didn't consume the Eucharist, then hey, stop them. They don't have a right to walk out of the church with that. You know, and these days you never know what kind of weirdo might come off the street and, and uh, you know, you see these protests and I always think, are the ushers ready to deal with that, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, it doesn't seem to happen in any of the southern churches much except um, Atlanta, I guess, where those kind of things, you know, once in a while happen. But, yeah, but the, the spirit that's within this group, if there's anybody who wants to be ushers, uh, to meet somebody coming in the door uh, with the fire that's in your heart now, I, I'm yeah. I was telling my buddy Pat here, I think it's yeah. going to be awesome. Because yeah, and, and, he's out, he smiles, he loves people, he genuinely loves people. And to, for people to see that when they come to the church, they need it. What is needed. Yeah, and it really should be, some places actually have greeters in addition to ushers, but really an usher should be a greeter. Mm -hmm.